Welcome to today's webinar, Pedestrian Infrastructure Safety and Health, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning with the Maryland Department of Transportation and our many other Walktober partners. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and host of the Walktober Walk in Our Series. Walking is an activity that many of us take for granted, but as pedestrian accident rates continue to rise and access to safe pedestrian spaces is diminished, communities are recognizing that walking and improving the walkability of our neighborhoods requires public attention and action. Throughout October, the Maryland Department of Transportation, in coordination with several state agencies and other partners, is sponsoring a series of webinars or walk in ours to highlight how we can collectively rally around walking, an activity that is both central to the state's active transportation efforts and a critical component promoting public well being. This is the second in the series. Thank you for joining us today, and please visit www.m.maryland.gov forward slash Walktober for more information about Walktober and to register for our other walk in ours that we'll be presenting this month. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it online. All participants today will receive an email with a link to the recording once it is posted. The Maryland Department of Planning also hosts the national web webinar series in association with the Smart Growth Network on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Pedestrian Infrastructure Safety and Health. The APA AICP CM site is currently down, so we'll, we'll be sending out the AICP CM number to all participants in a follow-up email. So to get started, our speakers today are Dr. Oliva Kukola or Buki Alonge, Candice Holford, and Jeff Dunkel. Dr. Alonge is the program team manager for the Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Control at the Maryland Department of Health. In this role, she oversees several federal grants. Her expertise as a physician and her many years of work with the State Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities provides her with the skill set to lead several chronic disease prevention and management programs. Dr. Alonge has a medical degree from the University of Abidjan in Nigeria, West Africa, and holds a master's in public health degree from Morgan State University. She resides in White Marsh with her husband and two children. Candice Holford is an urban planner who began her career at MSHA in 2017. As the regional planner for Montgomery and Frederick counties, Candice serves primarily in the Office of Planning and Preliminary Engineering's Regional and Intermodal Planning Division as the MDOT SHA liaison to Northern, Was Northern Washington, D.C. regions, local governments, including municipal, county, and regional jurisdictions, as well as other governmental agencies, business, civic, and community organizations, elected officials, and the general public. Candice is also leading the context driven team in planning and implementation efforts to deliver MDOT SHA's first pedestrian safety action plan which will focus on safety for all users. Finally, Jeff Dunkel joined the Maryland Highway Safety Office in 2017 as their Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Program Manager. Prior to this, he served as the Pedestrian Safety Coordinator for Montgomery County, Maryland's Department of Transportation, where he led the county's implementation of its Pedestrian Safety Initiative, a strategic plan aimed at reducing pedestrian and bicycle crashes in the county. Implementation of the initiative's seven strategies that targeted engineering, education, and enforcement countermeasures at high crash locations in areas of heavy pedestrian and bicycle activity successfully reduced pedestrian fatalities in Montgomery County by more than 30% between 2007 and 2017, a time in which national pedestrian fatalities increased by 35%. Jeff has brought his experience in reducing pedestrian bicycle fatalities and serious injury collisions to the Maryland Department of Transportation and the Maryland Highway Safety Office as they work to achieve zero deaths 
implementing Maryland's Strategic Highway Safety Plan. Following their presentations, our panelists will answer questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And before we get started, we'd like to share a brief video from MDOT Secretary Greg, Greg Slater. Thanks for sharing that video, John. If anyone has trouble uh, uh, viewing any of the uh, videos or audio, you may need to refresh your screen today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Longe. Thank you. And thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And um, I would like to appreciate um, I would like to appreciate the uh, Maryland Department of Transportation for the opportunity to present today, and thank everyone for joining us on this webinar. Um, so I will start by so as I've already been introduced, um, um, Dr. Longa and I work with um, the Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Control at the Maryland Department of Health. On this current slide, you would see the mission and vision of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. And um, the mission is to protect, promote, and improve the health and well-being of all Marylanders and their families through provision of public health leadership and through community-based public health efforts in partnership with local health departments, providers, community-based organizations, public and private sector agencies, given special attention to at-risk and vulnerable vulnerable population. And the vision is a future in which all Marylanders and their families enjoy optimal health and well-being. And um, what I will be presenting on today is the health benefits of physical activity. Walking is what we are concentrating on. Um, but like we all know, there are several types of physical activity. Um, however, we've chosen to talk about walking and the points around that will be shown as we proceed with the slide. Um, the World Health Organization defines um, health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of a disease. It's important to put that in perspective because health is not just about if we feel okay, but just it's, it's not just merely the absence of disease. And it's important to know that there are several factors that affect health, right? And um, some of them we can modify, some of them we cannot modify. If something is related to genetics, for example, we might not be able to modify that. However, there are things that are dependent on other factors like 
fiscal activity, like the environment, like policies and things of that nature. And those ones we can absolutely modify. The learning objective for this section of the webinar is to recognize working as a form of fiscal activity, to understand the health benefits of working, to identify working initiatives from the, from the Center for Crony Disease Prevention and Control at the Maryland Department of Health. The current slide that is being shown, um, it reflects the fiscal activity guidelines for Americans. And this is the second edition. You can see the link as well as a picture on this particular slide. The second edition is the most up-to-date version. And there are several recommendations for different populations. Highlighted on the screen are the recommendations for adults as well as children. And we see from here that at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity should be completed by all adults weekly. For children, it's recommended that 60 minutes or more um, should of various engaging activities that help kids to move is the recommendation. There is a recommendation for people that are in the much older population, the elderly, as well as even for pregnant women, no matter what phase of life we're in, we can all exercise. There is something for everyone, and there is a recommendation. Um, it was found in a study that was done by the Surgeon General, it was found that only half of the adults in the United States exercise based on the recommendation, and even about a quarter of high school students meet the guidelines of the recommended, recommended um, amount of physical activity that is expected, which led to the right to the writing of the Step It Up, which is a Surgeon's General Call to Action. And the goal of this document is to increase walking by working together to increase access to safe and convenient places to walk and wheelchair rule and to create a culture which supports walking for all Americans. And the question could be that why is it walking that is the recommendation. Like I said, any physical activity, once you get moving, you cycle, you swim, you do, there's so many types of physical activities that one could engage in. But walking, the reason why walking is recommended is um, for a few reasons that I'll get to in the next slide. This slide was put here because even in Maryland as a state, um, the governor and the state has recognized walking as the official state exercise. And on this slide, you see the proclamation that was given, uh, that was signed by the governor as well as the lieutenant governor, um, declaring October 7 as Walk Maryland Day. Uh, and on the, on, the, on the right side on the slide as well, you see the logo um, that is being used across the state for Walk Maryland. Uh, all the walking as uh, MDOT has been using it. Uh, other partners across the state are also using the same logo. The Maryland Department of Health also uses this logo as well. So, like I said before, why walking? Why why are we recommending walking if there are so many diverse types of physical activity exercises that one could take? And the first reason is that walking is free, right? Anybody can walk. And as you saw in the Step It Up um, document, it even talks about providing um, making sure that they are wheelchair accessible and making sure that their route that every population can take is accessible and available to all people. So you see here it's because walking is free, it does not require any special skills, and it is modifiable just like I talked about for all populations. It doesn't require you paying for a gym membership or any expensive equipment, and it has several proven health benefits. And on the next slide, I would showcase the, um, a few of the different benefits that one could get um, from walking. And this you could find on the CDC website, and the link has been placed there as well. It talks about the benefits of walking. If you want to lose weight, walking is a way to go. If you want to maintain the weight loss, that you've already experienced, walking is also the way to go. Um, it also helps to control and to prevent several chronic diseases. Like we know, nationally and Maryland is not an exception. The rate of diabetes and the rate of cardiovascular disease, the rate of hypercholesterolemia, the cholesterol um, range for individuals across the state is rising. 
Um, and a lot has to do with the way we live, um, the, the diet, and the fact that we many Americans live a sedentary lifestyle. So walking also helps to reduce the risk of high blood pressure, developing high blood pressure, or even maintaining and preventing complications as well. It also reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and several forms of cancer. So not just, it's not just for people that are diabetic, but even those who are pre-diabetic or even anyone that has not been diagnosed, you can prevent the rate or the likelihood of you developing these diseases. Um, some people say, well, I do have a family history, so it is, I am going to get the condition, but that is not the case all the time. There are things that we could do to also prevent that. So walking is the way to go with that. It reduces arthritis pain and the associated disability that comes with arthritis. It reduces the risk for osteoporosis, um, which is a condition that allows, that causes people to have fragile bones and are predisposed to having fractures and also reduces the risk of falls. Um, reduces the symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, if you've taken a walk on a day when it's bright and shining, the birds are chirping, and you can just go into nature, you see how it makes you feel. So just on the same way, it's been proven to reduce um, the symptoms of depression and anxiety. So next, I'll talk about a few um, initiatives um, that are the um, Center um, for Chronic Disease Prevention and Control at the Maryland Department of Health support. Um, one is there is a Health and Wellness Council for the state of Maryland, and one of the committees on this is the Fitness Committee. And what they do is to advise the council and to support the state in all efforts as related to physical activity, um, walking being one of the things, like we have mentioned. Definitely everywhere we go, we're speaking to the fact that everyone should get at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. And the fitness committee is a champion on behalf of the department for all Marylanders, talking about how to increase um, and put that information out there. And we know, and I would like to mention one thing with the, with the current um, situation we're all in as a nation and even internationally with the COVID pandemic. Um, the COVID pandemic with the restrictions of social distancing, the face mask and everything, um, walking is one thing that you can do because outside there's so much space and you can absolutely social distance. And whenever social distancing is not possible, you can absolutely use your mask as well. So let this situation, let this pandemic um, not be an opportunity for us to see increased rates of these conditions when we can walk. So those are part of the efforts of the fitness committee. Another thing that I've put here is a Walk Maryland Planning Committee. Uh, and I would like at this moment to appreciate every partner that has worked together with the Maryland Department of Health, including NDOT, who is the one um, put, who has put together this webinar today, and all the other partners. Um, this is a committee that has been meeting year long right from January up till the point when the Walk Maryland Day took place on October 7th. So this is a committee where um, people come together just to determine how uh, we can support um, the celebration of the Walk Maryland Day, which was on October 7th. So we thank all our partners. And other evidence-based programs um, that we also support, and there are so many of them. And here I have the Safe Routes to School program. And the Safe Road to School is an approach that provides walking and biking to school through infrastructure, um, improvements, enforcement of, um, of enforcement and tools, um, and incentive to encourage walking and bicycling. So ultimately, this is a program that supports students and provides accessible routes for, routes for them to walk or bike to school. Essentially, that's what it is. And right now, the center supports programs in three counties across the state. Another is the Evidence-Based Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a program that is targeted at people that have prediabetes, which is a condition where the HbA1c, which is the hemoglobin A1c, which is a test um, of your blood sugar control, um, if for these individuals, they are not yet in the diabetic range, and you can prevent the progression to diabetes by just 
um, instituting some different modalities, part of which is diet management, as well as physical activity. So that is an evidence-based program that the center also supports. And the chronic disease self-management program, which is for all chronic diseases, including the high blood pressure, as well as other um, chronic diseases. And another program that the center supports is the NICPAD's inclusive community implementation process. And we're actually implementing this in two local health departments in the state. And the purpose of this program is to integrate individuals with disabilities in evidence-based programs. Because as we know, everyone, just like the Surgeon General had said, everyone is able to walk no matter the situation, no matter where you are, we should all be able to access um, pathways and places by which we can walk. And that's what the NICEF is all about. Um, and this is just a slide that, says, um, that is being promoted by NICPAD, and it's called the How I Walk campaign. And this is just also to support the fact that even with a disability, you should definitely be able to walk with accessible wheelchair, accessible um, pathways, and things of that nature. And I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening. And on the slide are my contact details, and if anybody would like to reach out to the department with any questions, by all means, please do send me an email. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you for this opportunity. Actually, yeah. before we uh, Jeff start, we're going to run a quick poll here of the audience just to see who's with us today. So you should have on your screen, uh, the question I'm attending today's walk in our as a planner, health professional, elected official, walk advocate or enthusiast, or architect or engineer. And if you're having trouble actually voting in the poll, you may need to exit from full screen mode so that you can access the options. So we'll give everybody a few seconds to respond. Folks are responding today. So, and uh, as soon as we're done with this, we'll turn it over to Jeff. Give you a few more seconds to respond about half half have already so thank you and thanks for everybody participating today okay so in our audience we have 60% uh, of us are planners 21% walk advocate or enthusiast uh, we have 9% health professionals or healthcare workers, 9% architects and engineers, and a few 1% elected officials. So with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. And uh, Dr. Lange, really appreciate you setting the, setting the tone for how important walking is to health. And uh, I'm here today that I'm gonna be um, uh, talking about um, how we need to be doing that safely. And because uh, as we walk uh, all about, especially in these times of COVID, um, you know, we find that uh, we're on the streets and we're tra sharing that with, um, with traffic. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, let's see here. Okay, people can see my screen. Yes, you're up. Just uh, put it in presentation mode. There you go. Yep. There we go. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I won't. Um, I, just to say that I've been here with the um, state uh, Maryland Highway Safety Office for three years, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all today um, about the programs in Maryland that uh, that uh, that we're engaged in, and the leadership of uh, Greg Slater of making pedestrian safety and bicycle safety a priority. As, as one of our modes of transportation. And uh, I'm really pleased to be part of the, working diligently on this. And uh, one of my colleagues, Candice, will be talking shortly about some of the great work SHA is doing. So thanks so much for, for letting me talk today. Um, I wanna uh, start by, by basically um, touching base on who the Maryland Highway Safety Office is. Um, <clears throat> we're the office that focuses on safety uh, primarily through behavioral change, and um, uh, we do this through grants and managing grants with our partners, with the uh, with the National <clears throat> Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and we focus on education and enforcement. Uh, we are about the behavior change through teaching people how to be safe and enforcement, getting uh, the police to enforce the laws that uh, 
uh, that keep everybody safe. And we do that coming together through a strategic highway safety plan. Uh, and prior, previously when I was with Montgomery County, I'd worked closely with the highway safety office as one of their local partners. And I know the importance of these partnerships and pulling together everybody throughout the state and trying to um, figure out how we can be safer. And one of the emphasis areas, we have six, you can see on the left side there, that column, we have impaired driving, distracted driving, aggressive driving, occupant protection, i.e. seat belts. And then pedestrian and bicycles is actually one of the um, uh, uh, key emphasis areas because it comprises many of our crashes. Um, and we also had to do a lot of work supporting <clears throat> Uh, all of our programs in the state with uh, analysis of, of uh, data and uh, traffic crash reports. And, uh, and also, most recently, uh, Vision Zero. Um, I want to say that uh, uh, Dr. Tim Kearns, our director, is the Vision Zero coordinator who is basically ushering in uh, a movement towards achieving zero traffic deaths in the state of Maryland by 2030. And how we're going to do that is by uh, focusing on a strategic highway safety plan um, that uh, we do this every five years. The current plan, uh, we're in the final year of that plan and about ready to come up with a new plan that will be issued this winter. Um, but the goal is to ensure safe, uh, secure, resilient transportation systems for everybody, for all road users, um, including the vulnerable ones. Uh, reducing the number of lives lost and uh, injuries sustained on Maryland roadways. And most importantly, building, strategy, uh, building um, partnerships um, to, to implement strategies and to strengthen our state and local um, efforts in a holistic way, in a integrated way, in a complementary way with all of our partners throughout the state. <clears throat> and we do this, many of you have heard about the uh, four E's of traffic safety. Um, and I wanna point out here that engineering here is at the bottom, not because it's the least important, but probably because it's it's the most important. It is the foundation upon which all else uh, uh, is is set. Um, the engineering component has been said that is about 60% of the safety improvements that we've um, achieved over the years, and uh, and it by by far it's it's a very very important part of what we are about, and uh, one of the reasons. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about that in the next presentation with Candice. But then we focus uh, in the Highway Safety Office on the enforcement and education, um, two of those, um, two of those um, uh, programs through grants, as well as emergency medical services. This is when, if we do a really great job on the three E's here uh, on the left, um, we basically won't have to have as much uh, reliance upon emergency medical services, but uh, we know that invariably people will be hit and we need to make sure that uh, that they are treated and, uh, and and we're able to save lives by uh, preventing uh, fatalities and serious injuries from occurring. So uh, these are the the three uh, the four E's of um, of traffic safety upon which we, we built our program. And I want to say that I'm here today to basically um, refute and bring some good news about two common misperceptions about uh, about pedestrian safety. One is that we um, that we're not really sure, you know, what exactly is causing these crashes, and and you know, there's uncertainty, and it's it's not clear, you know, what can be done to improve them. And second, and secondarily, there's nothing we can really do to to um, to you know reduce the numbers of crashes, because in fact we can, and we have, and we know that it does work when you bring these four E's to bear on specific locations and areas, uh, as they've done in Montgomery County. This is a table that shows essentially the crashes that occurred and what they uh, are now calling their high injury areas, uh, those locations where they've had a high concentration. As you can see here in this table, we've had you know, some of these as many as nine, eight, six uh, crashes happening in these sections of roadway, maybe half a mile, uh, quarter mile to half a mile in distance. <clears throat> and um, uh, what they began uh, what we began doing in Montgomery County back in 2008 in implementing their initiative was to do what we called safety audits or pedestrian road safety audits where we would go out with a multidisciplinary team and look at the <clears throat> issues that were seen to be leading to these crashes occurring come up with a series of engineering treatments that could be done and then follow that with education and enforcement um, uh, actions uh, on those corridors where we were making the pedestrian safety improvements and you can see that um, essentially the results of that is is, is pretty pretty uh, significant. We've at almost every location except one, we have had a sustained reduction of the number of crashes that occurred. 
And this gives us hope that we actually can do something to eliminate um, and, and eventually get to zero uh, pedestrian uh, you know, fatalities um, you know, by putting, putting these targeted efforts um, you know, on, on specific locations. Um, and this, this uh, technique is working throughout. The, this is our uh, traffic fatalities in the state of Maryland over the years. And you can see there's been a, uh, a pretty impressive uh, decline um, that has occurred essentially since the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, a little bit uh, right now, we're, we're, we're trying to get a new direction downward, but the point is, is that we have significantly dropped uh, these crashes from the highs of the 60s, which is when uh, traffic safety became such a, such a major focus with NHTSA. <laughs> However, it is true that, as Greg Slater mentioned in his opening, uh, that we do have the numbers going the wrong direction here in Maryland, uh, or we have. And uh, for essentially the last three years um, of, of data, we were in an upward upward uh, direction. Um, and we're hopeful that this last year, uh, 2019, we actually saw a slight decline. <clears throat> but when you put that in a 10-year framework, we essentially average about 111 uh, pedestrian fatalities a year. And you can see we're a little higher in these last uh, last three years than we would like to be, but um, the reality is is that uh, you know that's that's almost a quarter of the number of total traffic fatalities in the second line down here. Uh, this last year is 23.4 percent of our total traffic fatalities were pedestrians, um, which is a big reason why we are focusing on this issue and it is an emphasis area in our plan. Uh, when we uh, look at bicycles. <clears throat> Uh, the other key component of our vulnerable road users. Um, very concerning back in 2016 when we were going up, there seemed to be an upward cycle. Uh, we're back down to close to our 10-year average. Uh, you know, we were real pleased in 2018 that we dropped to six and uh, we had 10 fatalities um, in, um, it went up. So that was concerning and it uh, looks like right now we're about at the same number for this 2020 period as we were last year. So um, so we're sort of in the uh, average uh, number of crashes, you know, eight to 10 um, uh, bicycle fatalities. Um, and that's again, about uh, a little less than 2% of the total traffic crashes. But the good news and bad news on these, on this inf on these crashes is that they are, they are happening in, you know, the bad news is they're happening at all, but, um, the good news is, is that the areas that they're happening are sort of concentrated in an area that we can target, as we've done in, in, in previous, uh, I previously spoke about in Montgomery County. Um, if we can target locations where we can try to make improvements, we're hopeful and we expect that we will be able to see some uh, significant reductions. Uh, when we look at uh, fatalities on the right side here, you can see that 72% of these fatal fatalities um, that are happening in the state are happening essentially in our urbanized counties in the uh, Washington and Met, uh, Baltimore metropolitan areas. We've got Prince George's County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Montgomery, and Anne Arundel. And, and similarly, when we look at just all crashes, uh, those are in the same jurisdictions. Uh, so essentially, this is occurring in those areas that are um, that are around the urbanized uh, two major urban centers that we have in the uh, state of Maryland. Um, and when we look at the Baltimore region, we can see that, uh, you know, we're averaging, you know, we're up, up there around the, in the 60s right now. Um, again, we had a slight decline last year. Um, and then in the Washington metro area, this is comprised of uh, uh, Montgomery, Prince George's, Charles, and Frederick counties. Um, you can see that we are, um, you know, kind of flat uh, this, last, uh, this last three years. Um, so we need to be turning this around the other direction. <laughs> Another important factor about where these crashes are occurring and enabling us to focus is that the fatal crashes are, are occurring primarily on our major thoroughfares. As you can see in this slide, uh, the teal colored um, portion of this uh, graph is showing us that, uh, that a large percentage of these crashes, um, in fact, 65% of them are happening on interstates, U.S. highways, Maryland roads, major arterials, as opposed to 34% are occurring on the local municipal roadways, uh, though some of those can be arterial as well. But the point is, is that, um, you, know, the, you know, all the way last year was, uh, in 2018, it was actually up to almost, you know, 87 plus percent. So um, this means that these major thoroughfares are where these fatalities are occurring and where we want to focus to address 
um, you know, reducing fatalities. However, when we look at all crashes, which is, um, you know, very important for us to be focusing not just on fatal crashes, but all crashes, and in so doing, we can, uh, you know, eliminate fatalities. Uh, you can see that over almost 60% of those crashes are occurring on the local roadways. And this emphasizes how important it is for us to be able to build partnerships uh, with local, let's say, strategic highway safety plans are now being developed with a lot of these localities. And most importantly, we need to be able to share location-specific crash data that is housed with SHA and the state police with our local jurisdictions to enable them to experience the same success that Montgomery County did by targeting efforts on improving those areas where crashes are occurring and putting in engineering and improvements with education and enforcement. And in so doing, we will be able to drive down the numbers of, of crashes occurring. <clears throat> I want to change from where these are occurring to who is this occurring? You know, who is who's involved in these pedestrian crashes? When we look at fatalities, interesting to me, I just uh, crossed the 60-year-old threshold. I saw that my previous demographic age group in the 50s was actually the most lethal um, group in terms of their demographic. I, this is the percentage of, um, of fatalities that are occurring within each of these different age groups. And um, you can see the red line here is actually indicating um, uh, what the uh, percentage of that population demographic is in the state of Maryland. So clearly, um, you know, we have 50 somethings are overrepresented in this a little bit to the 20 somethings um, and a little bit to 60 somethings. Um, so, uh, however, when we look at all crashes, interestingly, we actually find that uh, that the younger groups are really the ones that are overrepresented in the uh, in the in, in the total crashes. So this means that we need to be focusing on younger groups and uh, in terms of um, you know education and enforcement in terms of eliminating these crashes. Um, and that uh, with the older groups, we're going to be focusing on the, the you know, what, what are the fatal crashes and what are the circumstances there uh, that uh, are leading to those, those increase of crashes. One of the common misperceptions and one of the uh, conventional wisdoms 10, 15 years ago was that pedestrians were always at fault or most often at fault in uh, in, uh, in these uh, pedestrian traffic crashes. And in fact, what we actually know when we look at all these crashes is that it's actually the drivers who are most often at fault. And in this, uh, this graph here, you can see that um, in this, uh, in when we take this, uh, this essentially what is a six year window here, the, the drivers are, for, are at fault 46% of the time as opposed to pedestrians being at fault 33% of the time. And that's significant because that means that we need to be focusing our education efforts on drivers. Um, it, yes, it's important that pedestrians are, are behaving in a safe manner on the roads, but it's also critical that drivers understand the role they play in preventing these crashes from occurring. And that leads us to what is our, I'm going to be wrapping up here with a, a quick summary of our uh, strategy and approach here with our two campaigns that we've targeted um, on our uh, metropolitan areas where most of the crashes are occurring. Uh, the two strategies we're employing right now is to develop a comprehensive outreach education campaign for the Baltimore and the Washington region, and combined, um, um, combining that with enhanced enforcement actions. And we're doing that through conducting training of police officers on best management practices for enforcing pedestrian safety laws. And I want to now share with you um, our, um, um, our, our campaigns in both of these um, uh, municipal areas. The first one is Look Alive, um, which is in the Baltimore Metropolitan area being managed by the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. Okay, and if you could uh, start that video there, Michael. over a year ago now and uh, we've been leveraging it for lots of um, lots of effect through social media and uh, uh, you know digital media uh, venues 
And um, um, I'm hoping that some of you in the audience today have, have seen this. And it basically, what it does is it personifies uh, the, the walk icon with Signal Woman, who is the, the woman who wants to come down and tell all the pedestrians, drivers, and bicyclists how to, how to be safe using the roads together and to try to bring a bit of um, uh, consciousness of, 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 you know, that it's, it could be a place where you need to be extra cautious so we don't, so we can be safe when we're walking for, for good health reasons. Um, and uh, so we have a series of, of messages that were targeted in this last round uh, towards pedestrians, because uh, this was sort of the first campaign in Baltimore in some time uh, that had been rolled out. And so we we're sort of focus, focusing a little bit on the pedestrians, uh, more of a target. Um, we had intended to do a, a second video of the um, uh, focusing on drivers, and unfortunately with COVID, we've been unable to do that. So, um, okay, so I need to go back to showing my screen there. Yes, and everybody's, okay, I guess we're, we're good. Okay, um, let's see if I can. Okay. Good. We're good. Okay, super. Okay. Still trying to learn how to use all these technologies here. Okay. Yeah, the next campaign I'm going to describe is the one that we uh, had rolled out a number of years ago. Actually, it's been actually about 18 years that Street Smart has been um, um, active in the uh, Washington region, and uh, this latest campaign with Street Smart focuses on um, fragile uh, fragility of life and uh, the idea we call it our our um, our shattered um, shattered lives campaign um, the idea being is that uh, vo uh, vulnerable road users pedestrians and bicyclists are are fragile and we need to be especially cautious uh, in uh, in protecting them and uh, that means looking out for them and um, and so a lot of the campaign messaging on this is actually targeting drivers um, and, uh, and we did this through uh, trying to raise people's awareness of the consequences of, um, of dangerous actions and making a little bit of social norming, trying to get, get folks to care about others. So uh, if we could get video two there. Those are particularly difficult um, uh, spots to produce. We had a series of three of them uh, last uh, last year, and um, and then we have expanded that this year um, by trying to um, uh, draw in a series of testimonials uh, from not just uh, the three people that we initially interviewed, but um, uh, others um, and. And we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sense, place a sense of caring on drivers' parts as well as pedestrians and others to try to be protective and care about uh, other people. And uh, October is, uh, as we pointed out, is Pedestrian Safety Month for the first year, first time. NHTSA has has uh, created this uh, focus period for pedestrians, and so we're launching. We launched that campaign um, for the current paint campaign um, on uh, the fifth of uh, October. So. And as I said, we're collecting a series of testimonials from, from people who are involved. And it's been amazing uh, how many people have come forward and, and wanted their story to be part of our uh, testimonial to share with others, um, to, to help, help make others safer. And, um, and what we've done is we've compiled those in a uh, what we're calling our testimonial wall, uh, which is traveling around right now. It's really difficult. This is a pre-COVID picture of our last press event we were able to actually have. Um, and when we launched this campaign last year, and uh, we're expanding the campaign this year through virtual means um, and traveling around with this uh, display uh, that people can see and be social distance while they're observing and listening to people's stories about uh, the impacts that uh, crashes and fatalities in their family have had. Um, <clears throat> we are also able to do a series of events with uh, our virtual reality car, which is a, um, which is a, um, uh, 
uh, you know, basically a uh, a gaming tech uh, uh, app that we put together to take, teach people how to drive safely uh, in scenarios on the roadway where uh, they're encountering pedestrians and bicycles. And this we had a great reception. Uh, we also, last time it appeared was uh, March uh, 3rd <laughs> at the uh, Baltimore uh, Health Expo. So um, anyway, the point is, is that we've had to, have had to suspend this during the current uh, COVID situation. But what's important is when we have these education campaigns is that we need to couple it with the, um, with the um, uh, enforcement. And so uh, we have, we really want to thank and call out to the um, Baltimore County Police Training Academy here with Frank Enko and, um, and Jason Keller. They've done a fabulous job of pulling together a training program. We've been putting uh, about 25 police officers through this training, um, you know, every uh, two or three months. Uh, and we just did a virtual online training for the first time, October 1st, where we had 50, 50 officers signed up. So this is not, we're not exhausting people's interest in this. We seem to be peaking it and, uh, and, and drawing people in to this because people care about this. Officers really want to um, create safe environments out there on the street. And so learning how to do safe uh, enforcement of pedestrian safety, traffic laws, and bicycle traffic safety laws uh, is, has been um, a huge part of what we're trying to get, get going here, uh, in this case now in the Baltimore region, but we're doing this uh, with people from out the state. And this is, we do real life uh, simulations here we have Dr. Kearns and myself being the decoys. Uh, fortunately, we weren't hit that day, but anyway. Um, but anyway, so we're real pleased with how this has turned out. And when you couple that with this, uh, these, um, these marketing, you know, outreach education campaigns, you can end up with results like this. Mike, I'm gonna. Okay. Great. Thanks, Michael. So where do we go from here with Signal Woman? Well, Signal Woman is bringing it on with more Signal people. Uh, and this is our latest um, campaign that we just launched a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we call it our Signal People Brigade. And uh, essentially, we have uh, folks dressed sort of like Signal Woman who are out on the street, masked, um, and uh, social, but they stay social distance with these traveling backpacks on their back. And, um, and we're real excited about this campaign. It's already gotten some buzz going here in the Baltimore region. And these folks here, we have a series of messages that are on the backs. And these are basically uh, um, backpacks that have LED lighting in them that light up like, like, like billboards, you know, especially at nighttime, you know, in the nighttime, it really is gonna draw attention to the messages that we're having. So we're gonna have these people out on the street. 
They don't have to interact because basically the messaging uh, on these backpacks says it all. And that's an important message because we have learned in our pedestrian fatalities reviews that darkness is such such a big factor, you know, visibility or lack of visibility is such a big factor in a lot of these crashes. And so that makes it so important that you be safe and be seen. And so we're gonna make that a major emphasis in um, October as we head into uh, the, the end of uh, daylight savings time and go to standard time. Pretty soon it'll be getting dark at five o'clock at night. And so you can see that these, um, these backpacks and people walking around on the street are gonna be able to draw attention to the messaging uh, that we're um, we're trying to get across there. So we're very excited about the, this new chapter. Um, and so with that, I want to end with the final video of the, the uh, report that just came out last week. If you can start this, Michael. Okay. So what gives us hope that this may work <laughs> is that uh, we're hopeful that in Baltimore County, where we have been actively engaging in these campaigns now for over a, you know a little over a year, um, we actually saw in 2019 a decline. The question is, is that uh, that's not enough. Uh, we still had 22 people killed in Baltimore County. So we are going to be trying to drive these numbers lower and uh, through these uh, programs that, uh, that you just, just saw. So thanks so much, and I uh, really appreciate the time to talk with you all. And now I want to pass the baton uh, and the presentation over to uh, uh, my colleague, Candice Holford, who's um, been a principal um, shining light over at SHA and pulling together how we can do context-sensitive design um, standards in a way that will make the roadway safer for pedestrians, and bicyclists, and, and the vulnerable road users. And she is implementing what Greg Slater talked about two years ago about needing to develop context sensitive standards uh, for SHA. And I'm so happy that Candice is here to 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 make that make that happen. So, uh, Candice. Good morning. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Would you be able to confirm, Michael? Well, what we're seeing is your presenter notes screen. So you might want to change your screen. Uh, how about this? Nope. Duplicate slideshow, okay. maybe? Thank you. How about. You need to select uh, a, um, a, a screen in your uh, application in your webinar application under sharing. Okay. 
And where it says screen, it's a drop down. Uh, let's see, I see sharing. And yes, it says... then, and then under show, there's a uh -huh. drop down menu. Okay. And you can select uh, which screen your your PowerPoint is now presenting on. Because what? Is that any what better? Uh, almost, except uh, your um, your notes are sitting in front of the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, sorry. You have to select the other one. Nope. Now we're seeing uh, your presenter uh, your presenter view. We're not seeing the slides. I wonder if you'd be able to go through the slides for me because I'm having a little trouble getting my slides. There you go. Whatever you did, you're right there. Sorry to break okay. in. All right. Thank you. I apologize for that, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Candice Holford. Um, I am the regional planner for MDISHAs um, covering Montgomery and Frederick counties. Um, I'm also the lead for the context guide and context driven team. Um, and so today I wanted to go over a little bit about how M.SHA is implementing Vision Zero and how we're progressing with our context driven efforts. Um, so uh, the three things that I'll touch on are the strategic plan, the Vision Zero action plan that comes out of our uh, strategic plan and the context-driven initiative linked to that um, Vision Zero action plan. Uh, MDOTSHA has been moving towards Vision Zero, particularly since the adoption of House Bill 885 in April 2019. Uh, and that bill established that Maryland um, is now a Vision Zero state. And SHA strategic plan northbound uh, outlines 10 initiatives on which MDOT SHA, SHA should focus over the next five years. So that is currently in development. And one of those 10 northbound initiatives is for MDOT SHA to implement a Vision Zero action plan. Um, so how does context-driven fit, fit into this picture? For MDOT, Vision Zero would be the umbrella under which uh, number of safety strategies are housed, and if Northbound is our guiding strategy, and Vision Zero is the goal, context-driven is how MDOT SHA has been, is, and will continue to fulfill this goal. Um, and within context-driven, MDOT SHA is developing an interactive update to the context guide online, um, which you can see there on the screen, um, and as well as a suite of tools that we envision sort of as a context-driven wheel. Um, and those, uh, some of those tools are shown there on the right side of the slide. So here's the wheel. I'll briefly review the components of our context-driven wheel before diving um, a bit more into detail about how we and SHA are progressing and how you can get involved. Um, first, MDOTSHA is developing its Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. I believe Jeff mentioned that earlier. Um, we're referring to it as a PSAP, and I'll be doing that for the remainder of the presentation. The PSAP will identify needs um, in our transportation system and identify why, how, and where we should address those needs. So over the next 12 to 18 months, our team will be undertaking a process that includes uh, research, analysis, benchmarking, um, as well as public engagement, um, eventually recommendations and prioritization of those recommendations. Phase one, which includes data collection and creating a public engagement plan, is currently underway. Uh, so the PSAP uh, will help us detail, as I mentioned, why, how, and where we need to implement the context-driven tools. And these tools include what you see um, on the right of the slide, two, three, and four. Um, they include the context guide, the context-driven toolkit, and eventually case studies. The fifth component of the context-driven wheel is education and outreach. Today's webinar included um, our practitioners at MSHA. Um, and we hope 
uh, those at local partner agencies will help us build awareness and familiarity with the context-driven approach to infrastructure. Um, they'll also be able to provide input along with all of our other customers as we develop and implement our PSAP. Sixth and last, we want this information to be easy to use, um, which means making it accessible. And so we're creating a one-stop shop online, um, a web portal that can uh, be accessed by practitioners, by elected officials, and by the general public. Um, so to better understand where to implement these improvements and ISHA needed to better understand um, the diverse context in Maryland, uh, you already have seen the draft version um, 1.0 of the context guide, which came about uh, September 2019. Um, and so to do so, MDISHA is developing an interactive update to the guide um, to be a little bit more explicit and a little bit more interact, uh, allow more interaction between the public and um, these um, uh, efforts and approaches that we're, we're trying to implement. Um, our 2019 release of the context guide provided SHA staff and the public an online mapping tool. So you've got the guide and you've got an ArcGIS online map to understand these contexts. Um, and then the guide also identified proactive treatments that will improve access, mobility, and safety for all users, um, but especially for pedestrians and bicyclists who are some of the most vulnerable um, users on our network. So all of these treatments are treatments that will lead us to vision zero. And again, this is something that we sort of kick-started last year. Um, and now we're sort of uh, looking to uh, reinvigorate that process and, and introduce some new things that we've been working on. Uh, so as you know, the context guide, um, what it did was it re-emphasized the relationship between access, um, which is how many places you can get to, and mobility, how far you can go. Um, whereas in the past, transportation agencies may have viewed the relationship between access and mobility as sort of a standard one-size-fits-all. Now what the context guide tries to do is identify six contexts give everyone a gradient um, ranging from rural to urban core that establishes what's actually appropriate um, in balancing access and mobility by context. As I mentioned, the context guide also identifies proactive treatments uh, that will improve access, mobility, and safety. Um, these treatments, speed limit reductions, roadway narrowing, road diets, improved lighting, pedestrian signals, and upgraded pedestrian crosswalks, um, coupled with enforcement, education, and EMS, will help us to meet our Vision Zero goals. <clears throat> so MDA-SHA has completed over 100 uh, proactive safety projects in the last 18 or so months, first focusing on our urban centers and urban cores as sort of our immediate um, action plan. Uh, we're starting to track our progress and developing tools like this um, unpublished map that you see here. It's not finished till under development, but eventually we'll have things like this available for everyone to view in the future. And just to explain some of the data behind our approach, I borrowed uh, these next few slides from our Office of Traffic and Safety. Uh, I thought it summarized our points um, made in the context guide, in the draft context guide, pretty well, um, as well as our approach to future implementation. Um, understanding, of course, that data, which may, as well as we do this right, change over time. Um, compared with non Compared with fatal non-motorist crashes, the overall um, non-motorist crashes rate crash rate increases from two to nine percent in urban cores, and from four to eighteen percent in urban centers. And based on our analysis, there are more chances for non-motorists involved in crashes in urban cores and urban cent uh, urban centers compared with other context zones, um, in large part due to relatively small land area being defined as an urban context. However, if a crash occurred, um, the severity in urban areas is generally lower than in suburban and suburban activity center or traditional town center context, likely due to lower prevailing speeds and motorist ex expectation for pedestrian activity in urban context. 
So now that we've begun to implement new and innovative treatments, what comes next? Um, well, in the next year, we'll continue to advance the efforts that we saw on the context wheel. Right now, one of the primary focuses for our team is filling, populating the context-driven toolkit. Some of these tools already exist and are being implemented, like continental crosswalk striping uh, to improve visibility for all users on the road. Um, and we're working to build um, to further build and uh, populate that toolkit to provide practitioners a wide range of options so they're able to identify the right treatment for the right location based on the right context. In addition, we'll begin to conduct case studies. Um, we've already introduced new treatments such as leading production intervals, as well as lowering speed limits in many corridors uh, with a special focus, as I mentioned, on urban centers and urban cores where we have more crashes and um, uh, transitioning to suburban activity centers where the crashes tend to be more severe. Um, while we know the general benefits of these treatments though, case studies allow us to take a more in-depth dive after we've had some performance data and establish the effectiveness of these treatments based on data-driven studies. So that might be one of the um, things you see a little bit later down the line, maybe next year, starting next year, um, probably late next year after um, some of these uh, countermeasures we've implemented since 2019 start to really um, show performance data. We'll also be sharing and collaborating with our partner agencies to increase the visibility of the context-driven approach will not only continue to educate our own workforce, but also engage the public. So over the next 12 to 18 months, um, we'll be doing this research analysis, benchmarking, public engagement, as I mentioned before, um, with phase one of that sort of just getting underway now. Um, over the next three to six months, you'll start to see more opportunities for engagement, as well as we flesh out and roll out our public input plan. And lastly, the web portal where everything will live. Um, information will be easy to use and accessible via an online web portal, which over time will incorporate models, maps, and various interactive tools, um, as well as presentations like what you're seeing today and presentations that we may have given in the past. We're creating, as I mentioned, a one-stop shop online where you can come and get all of this information, see our progress, see what we're doing, maps, models, all the fun stuff. So in summary today, we sort of went over how Vision Zero and Context Driven fit into MDISHA as an organization, as well as the steps that we're taking to strategically create guidance and tools um, to make Vision Zero a reality. MDISHA remains committed to improving and maintaining high quality, safe, and efficient roadways for each and every Marylander. So thank you for joining. Um, please, if you can, take some time to jot down my contact information. Um, I can be reached at kholford at m.maryland.gov. Um, but I also, um, my team has access to SHA context guide at m.maryland.gov as well. And I will hand it back to Michael. Great, thank you all. Uh, for patients. Uh, we've been getting a number of questions here, and we have about 20 minutes or so uh, to take those for you. And then uh, anyone who wants to also add other questions, please uh, add them to the questions tab, and we'll uh, keep going till about 11 o'clock or so. And I see that our panelists have turned on their webcam, so you can see them during this portion. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple questions that we got, I think from Jan Rutke uh, from the town of Chesapeake Beach. And so uh, she's curious about a couple of things. And the first one starts with a comment. Um, and she says, uh, my town of Chesapeake Beach has professionally drawn plans to increase walkability in our town. We are ready to apply uh, grants. Who might be the point person I could contact if funds are available? I think I might that. be able to answer that. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. 
Um, so in addition to working with the context guide team, I am a regional planner. I work in the regional and intermodal planning division at M.SHA. And my colleague, um, Christy Bernal, leads the Transportation Alternatives and Safe Routes to School program. Um, she is the program manager, um, Christy Bernal. And you can also reach out to me directly, and I can put you in touch with her for a status update on those programs and what might be available. Let, let me uh, just let me um, add in that uh, we're going to be uh, doing outreach uh, a number of years now. We've been involved with um, uh, holding sessions um, either with the actual going out to actual areas and uh, you know with district uh, different SHA district offices and uh, holding sessions talking about all the different grant opportunities. Uh, Gendis is you know she mentioned Christy Burrell. We we basically have uh, grants for a fixed physical uh, infrastructure. Um, and that's one one of the package one of the programs. We have a series of programs that uh, that you know you can apply to. In the case of the Maryland Highway Safety Office, we give grants for educational efforts and for in, uh, enforcement. And um, and so we are able to basically um, you know uh, you know issue those grants to police departments or to um, you know DOTs or planning offices that are doing outreach education. And um, and we are very eager looking, we are actually looking for people to apply for grants because we have money available through uh, th through NHTSA um, federal monies. And uh, so even in these tough budgetary times, uh, we're strongly encouraging people to apply for, for grants uh, for pedestrian bicycle safety in particular. It's, that's my, my specialty. So um, anyway, so yeah, so I would encourage you to, if you wanna send, uh, uh, send your name to, to me or Candice, uh, we can put you in touch with the people that are organizing the outreach efforts. There'll probably be a large um, uh, webinar event sort of like this um, in late late January, beginning of February is usually when we do this. So, um, and Maryland Highway Safety Office grants have to be uh, submitted by the beginning of March. Um, and I think like the bike waste programs and the others, those usually, um, I think their deadline is a little bit later in the spring, but um, we talk about all that in, in that uh, presentation. So yeah, we are really, about building partnerships. So please get in touch with us and let's do this together. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, actually, she had a kind of a follow-up question here that I'll read. Uh, we have two state roads that run through our There's a long stretch of one of these roads with no crosswalks, including in front of an elementary school. In the past, the SHA has resisted our effort. The state's emphasis on walkability and we expect uh, more cooperation from SHA so we can traverse this road safely. Agreed, understood. Um, I definitely would love to get your information and sit down and figure out where we can be of assistance, we SHA. So um, I'm on the same page as you. And again, I'm Kay Holford at m.maryland.gov. I, I know that I, I believe ahead, Chesapeake ahead. Beach is in District Five and and uh, SHA District Five, right? So I think so. Yeah, and I know that they're doing a lot to trying to look at uh, safety improvements to be made now. So there's been a lot of lot of changes in the SHA in the last uh, two or three years. So let's let's work on it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Longy, did you want to say something? I don't know if you're muted. Okay, go ahead. Hmm. Make some issue with your audio. Hmm. Are you self muted, to Dr. Longa? Yes, she is. So we'll work on that with her. In the meantime, uh, I guess we'll, for now, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, it's also related to safe uh, routes to schools. Um, what efforts are being made to create routes to school programs in all counties? And how does one go about uh, requesting a safe route for their children's school? It seems more sidewalks need to be more uh, crossing guards hired. 
Um, with the Safe Routes to School program, um, and that's a good point. I mean, infrastructure is, is one component, um, but as we mentioned, there are sort of four E's to pedestrian and bicycle safety. So um, speaking only to the infrastructure component, our Safe Routes to School program um, has certain eligibility requirements, including um, a match, uh, cash match requirement. And so um, I would love to go through those with you and see uh, where we can actually get you some assistance and where the obstacles might be um, with regards to infrastructure improvements. Um, but maybe Jeff can talk about other areas. Yeah, in, in case it's right, there, there is a Safe Routes to School program that the state uh, SHA administers. Uh, uh, but I will tell you that Safe Routes to School is oftentimes a local issue uh, because a lot of these schools may not even be on state roadways. And um, uh, and so um, I would encourage you to reach out to your uh, county DOT um, that uh, um, that may be, um, they may have a program. I know in Montgomery County and in, I know in Prince George's County, they have pretty, uh, pretty uh, active programs uh, to try to uh, improve pathways, um, you know, safety and pathways to the schools, and then to also work with this, uh, with the kids and the teachers and the um, principals in, in doing education outreach. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, a probably a whole network that you could plug into through your local DOT. And this is the importance of the partnership because they are partnered with SHA. Some of the grants uh, that they admit that are administered, um, you know, come from uh, SHA funding, uh, which is ultimately comes from the feds. So, um, but anyway, so yeah. So yeah, get in, get in touch with your local DOT as well as with um, our Safe Rasta School Group. Again, these are grants that, will, that are issued um, and will be talked about in that um, uh, winter effort. And, January, February, so. And I would also add um, that reaching out to your district office and knowing who your district engineer is and the assistant district engineer for traffic is usually a pretty good place to start as well. They're really um, plugged into our Office of Traffic and Safety um, who sort of manages um, design requests for things like that if they're on a state road, so. Oh. Hi, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so what I was going to say, and I'm sorry I had to dial in again and I didn't hear the last question, but I wanted to speak to the first question. And my response will be that the Maryland Department of Health also does offer funds um, to local communities to do the Safe Route to School program. Uh, we currently have grants with the health departments in St. Mary, Somerset, and Washington counties. And these are CDC funding that we receive, and part of what we're meant to do is this. And also, we also do have a disability grant from the CDC as well. And part of what we do is this, this is the walkability assessment in communities. Um, so we encourage you to first reach out to your local health department, or you could also contact me via, my, via the email um, shown on the screen, and I'll be able to navigate you, but yes, um, the health department also supports this because we understand the importance of the built environment in health. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, recently there's been an emphasis on part of transportation planning. How are you including this in your plan? You kind of broke up there a little bit. I, I lost that opening. Can you? Okay, I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat it. Recently, there has been an emphasis on equity as part of transportation plan. How are you including this in your plan? I can give that a start. Um, it's it's um, a good question and something that I'm prepared to answer now because we're really just starting the process of developing goals and objectives for our pedestrian safety action plan. Um, and that we have in doing this brainstorming right before we go out to the public and get some get some assistance from you all we've really identified equity as a, a very important factor um something that should be woven into our goals and objectives um so that's definitely something that we're considering in developing our pedestrian safety action plan over the next year Oh, well, um, and, we're, and we're certainly looking for input from the public as to how we can do that best. So that we'll expect to see surveys and, and um, other online opportunities for you to, to give your, your input. 
And we're, um, as I mentioned in our Maryland Highway Safety Office, we have uh, we do a lot of work with data support. And this equity issue has emerged in this last year or so of being a very, you know, very, very important. And uh, and and we are, I believe that the current plan right now is we're going to be overlaying some of this crash data with um, with demographic with demographics and land use, and uh, and that will enable us to uh, help help to provide input on the whole question of equity and uh, where where resources need to be applied. So. And I just think that's great. And I just wanted to make a comment based on what Jeff said. I think the first part of being equitable is having data. Um, there's no other way around it, because if you do not know what the demographics are, then how do you even make it equitable? So thank you for saying that. Thank you. Thank you. And I should probably re-emphasize that SHA works pretty closely with highway safety. Jeff Dunkel is a veteran SHA person. I'm sure we collaborate with other um, other business units under the state of Maryland, so um, MDH as well. And and I think that having that communication line open and and having this be a collaborative process really helps helps us meet those um, data needs and 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 um, make sure that we're analyzing it um, to the best of our capabilities. By using all our resources. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here is uh, what types of criteria are looked at as part of the RSAs? What types of solutions are being implemented to reduce crashes in the targeted areas? Okay. Uh, Kenny, do you want to take that or do you? <laughs> I... um... As you, as you, I think you mentioned, um, we uh, we have a history of doing pedestrian road safety audits, and that's something that SHA is really trying to um, to restart again. Um, but uh, definitely, highway safety has been um, monitoring that data, the historical data that we have, and we're looking for ways to refresh that. So I think having an accurate data set um, is is important and perhaps Jeff can speak um, as a veteran to how we've done um, applied that in the past. I like this term veteran. It sounds better than the old guy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do. Uh, I, I yeah, I have done a lot of the. I've been involved with a number of the road safety audits, and um, and I will tell you that it's a it's a it's a work in progress because it, it it can always be made better. Um, the ones that I've been involved with have involved. Um, multidisciplinary teams that usually involve police, uh, uh, traffic engineers, um, pedestrian advocates, uh, folks that might be involved with land use planning, you know, planners uh, that are that are aware of these issues and, and, and potential land use development. And the idea is that you basically take a stretch of road and you spend time observing it over uh, different times of the day, essentially, so you're, you know, capturing all times of day you know, over the course of several uh, usually several days or you know maybe over a couple of weeks that you're doing these audits and then in the process of doing that what you're looking for are the uh the the vulnerabilities of you know the behavior based on the behaviors what are people um you know doing and what are the uh what is the infrastructure that's enabling some of those those movements and conflicts uh to be happening and uh you know the first thing to do is usually list you come up with a list of maintenance oriented uh, improvements that can be done at relatively low cost and simple things like trimming bushes that are obstructing um, you know uh, street lights and and uh, identifying street lights that are out and uh, identifying places where there may be a lack of any kind of crossing or a sidewalk connection those types of things and so um, usually maintenance improvements are made fairly quickly and then uh, the engineering aspect sometimes when you have to identify maybe a a signal is needed or some kind of a crossing opportunity uh, that would involve um, you know a new uh, you know new type of a hawk signal or something like that um, and so we uh, those usually have a longer lead time they involve more money so budget becomes an issue sometimes but uh, in the case in Montgomery County we would partner with uh, the state and we usually split costs and we would uh, usually implement things in over about a two-year period um, and with engineering improvements. Um, and so um, it, it usually involves sidewalks, uh, crossing opportunities, lighting, um, uh, other things too. <laughs> and then also we identify education uh, shortcomings where people may 
uh, may not uh, you know be aware of the fact that they need to cross at the uh, at the at the uh, cross signals and and so we work with the um, police and uh, and the education side um, you know usually following um, engineering improvements that are made but those are the types of things that we do there, there's kind of a there's kind of a recipe if you will that uh, that has been developed and I will say that many of the traffic engineers especially in a lot of these districts district offices now um, have really developed quite a list of treatments that can be done and but you always have to balance there are issues with um, balancing that with uh, the vehicular movements and all that so it, it's a it's a it's 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 as much art as science I think sometimes though I would and my engineering friends would call it science. <laughs> so. I would agree in that saying that it's as much of an art as a science because while there's a recipe, you know, and we and we sort of did them in a formulaic way, these road safety audits in the past, we're looking at how we can start to weave in our context-driven approach so that it's not so formulaic all the time. And, and we have um, data-driven, a data-driven lens with which to look through to apply these equity factors and other things related to land use that tell the story more about the context. So our district offices are definitely doing seed studies and various other types of studies to um, assess and analyze the conditions of our roads and, and the infrastructure there. Um, but we at headquarters are making sure that our district offices, that our access management and the developers that we work with are all in the loop on some of these context-driven um, treatments that we have um, populating the toolkit. Thank you. Do you all mind a few extra minutes since we have a lot more questions that have come in? Is that okay? Great. Yeah, I'm just sitting at home. I got all day. <laughs> well, we won't do that much extra time. <laughs> Great. Um, next question is, uh, what kind of analysis has been done about where crashes are taking place? For example, at intersections in the middle of the road where pedestrians should not be and so on? That's, yes, the, uh, the short answer is a lot, right, Andy's. Um, we're, uh, we're basically using crash data to try to identify um, where these where these crashes are occurring. And that got a little, I, I sort of, I didn't, uh, I have a whole nother presentation that involves a lot of talk about trying to target efforts, you know, based on uh, geocoded crash data. But um, the reality, there's a little bit of sensitivity in terms of how, how much of that can be released in a public forum. So I, I, I um, we worked very closely with our SHA um, uh, colleagues in trying to um, trying to produce reports that we can provide to local um, jurisdictions. And in fact, we've been recently doing that. We have made incredible progress. A little bit of backstory. In Montgomery County, we had a separated, a separate system where we were able to take all of our crash data and uh, with our own data analysis, we were able to map it and identify it. This is from way back in 2010. And as a result, we were able to come up with those targeted locations that you saw on that, that table that I presented to you all. And I was really a little surprised because that information was not as readily available um, at the state level um, initially when I first got here and, and we weren't able to really share that information. That has all changed. Um, there's been a huge step forward these last two or three years here now with uh, trying to partner with our local jurisdictions and provide them with this crash uh, location specific crash data that is enabling them to identify where um, you know where these crashes are occurring you know whether it be you know intersections or you know uh, road sections where there might be a lot of pedestrian traffic but no crossing opportunity those type of things so um, uh, we are entertaining requests from local jurisdictions uh, and we work with, we have a, a, a GIS system, graphic, a geographic information system called Raven uh, that we use to do the analysis and we map this. And I know Candice is very involved that the SHA has really, really advanced uh, this effort as well at their, at their internal levels uh, to do this uh, uh, context, to, to drive context driven um, improvements, you know, you need to have data that tells you where these things are occurring. And, and use that to help uh, direct your efforts. So um, anyway, so the short answer is crash data we're using. Um, 
and we're geocoding that and providing that as a as a guide to where we are trying to uh, do these improvements and conduct do the analysis on what needs to be improved. And with these new changes, um, you know, that are coming up in terms of information sharing, I think this is a great time for SHA to be developing a pedestrian safety action plan. But not only that, we're also trying to, you know, we recently launched our long-term strategic plan, which includes the Vision Zero Action Plan as one of the 10 initiatives SHA um, is working on over the next year, and that will be a five-year plan. One of, part of Vision Zero for SHA is learning what resources we have ava available and where all the data is. A lot of these offices have been working, you know, to the best of their ability to, to um, aggregate this data and then um, display it. And so it would be a really good opportunity for SHA now to get into the game and work with our Office of Traffic Safety and Highway Safety and all of these different offices to make sure that we can share the same information and maybe even have one place where you're getting the same data um, that you might be getting from an individual transportation business unit. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question here, uh, kind of COVID related. Um, given COVID changes, including fewer rush hour driving commutes, more walking for exercise from home, less drinking in bars and so on, and recognizing that uh, post COVID, many COVID behavior changes won't go away, what impact do you expect or hope to see in safety data for these last seven months? And will there be any lessons in that future changes to tweak our safety strategy. Good question. <laughs> um, Dr. Olangi, do you have any any thoughts on that in terms of? Yes, I was thinking. I was thinking I could speak a little bit to that, and that's a really valid question and a valid concern, right? Um, with the onset of COVID and many people being indoors, we're concerned about people not even being able to move out and exercise and things of that nature. And um, from the Maryland Department of Health, a lot of what we've been doing, actually the communications department has been largely vested in COVID messaging. So I think social media is a large part of what we can do to combat this. And what they've been doing is putting out appropriate messages on the MDH Facebook and Twitter handles um, talking about what people should be doing in the midst of COVID. Um, behavioral change is a whole, it's, it's, I don't, I, that's a great question and behavioral change is something that really takes time and now with the, with the current state, um, with the face we are as a state and the ability of people to move out, the messaging is around encouraging people to do that. I'm not sure we can do more about that. I think we'll look to see what the data says down the line. Um, yeah. So I think all I can speak to about that is that MDH is all about social messaging um to encourage people to be more active and of course i think this other things around drinking and other behaviors are other things that we need to also concentrate on because they are going to these are going to be real issues down the line i'm not sure if that was helpful but that's how i can tackle that yeah we just um we just had a, some interesting um reports presented to us a couple of days ago uh at the uh, washington Metropolitan Council of Governments uh, Transportation Subcommittee, and also our uh, our data team um, in uh, Maryland Highway Safety Office has been looking at um, sort of the post COVID, the COVID period crash data. And uh, what's interesting is we're finding, and this is disappointing to all of us in the traffic safety business, um, is that the numbers are not going down. Uh, we're, we still have, um, in fact, in some cases, they're going up in some areas of vehicular crashes. So. Um, and I, my pedestrian numbers have not gone down as I had sort of hoped they might, you know, when we were all walking and nobody was, you know, driving for a while there. Um, and what's interesting though is when you put that against mile, vehicle miles traveled, that's actually, it looks like the, uh, the crash rate has gone up quite a lot. But um, it's interesting because we don't really have good information about people walking. 
And so it could be that we just have a lot more people walking about, i.e. there's a lot more exposure. And uh, so we were able to um, you know, benchmark that with actual people walking. Uh, it may actually, the rate might not have gone, you know, may, may have gone down. But the point is, we do know that the numbers are not going down right now. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's, that's concerning, you know, that we're, we're looking, looking for improvements and it looks like COVID is not gonna be the, um, the result of that, you know, not gonna cause that, so. Thank you. I do I know do that other, um, I apologize, uh, MDOT, the secretary's office is definitely looking into ways to um, start tracking our, our bicyclists and pedestrians a little bit more accurately and getting those numbers, seeing what different um, measures we can use, whether bicycle level of comfort or level of traffic stress might be something that we need to shift to. And I think you'll probably see some, some changes hopefully in the next year. Okay, thanks, Candice. We'll do a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, next one is, I see some towns have signs and crosswalks that state that it's Maryland law to have stop for people in crosswalks. Are there any limitations to where we can put those signs? Is this law truly statewide and can we get signs from SHA? Signs that um, restrict, I'm sorry, what kind of signs? Uh, to, to find people to stop crosswalks. Yeah, I, I think they're referring to the paddles that we have that uh, say, you know, stop, you know, state law, stop for pedestrians in crosswalks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also they're up on the side as well, oftentimes at crosswalks. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's long as they're in compliance with the MUTCD, you know, I guess it's, it's fine. I was going to say um, my best guess as a non-engineer is that it's based on what what's in the law of MUTCD. I will say that a lot of those um, a lot of those sidewalk locations are oftentimes in local jurisdictions, uh, roadways, um, and so that would be the place you should probably start uh, in requesting that um, because the local uh, local highway you know state the DOTs are the ones that are essentially putting up the signage in those kinds of situations. SHA um, has those signs up on the state uh, where they have them on state roads, but a lot of those are major arterials, and so. Um, uh, but it, again, as Candice mentioned, that would be the district office that you would want to work with and, and the district engineers. Um, and, uh, um, and we are putting those, that signage up. There was a period of time, I know, when some of us, we were trying to, um, I think there was an effort to try to reduce signage. And I think that, I, I think now with the emphasis on pedestrian, on vulnerable road users and pedestrian bicycle safety, um, I, Talking with your district SHA office would be the, a good place to go. But your DOT, would, your local DOT would be a good starting point, so. Okay, thank you. Um, question here, how can a lay person or partner get involved with these initiatives and help to promote uh, public education? I would say well, not, not the local. Okay. Go, please, Dr. Alonga. Thank you. I would say start at your local level. Um, in your community, start with your local leaders. Move it up to the local departments. Like I said, we as the Maryland Department of Health, we work a lot with the local health departments. Um, I'm sure there are other partners. I'm sure transportation would have their own group of partners. So starting in the community, starting to work with the leaders in your community, escalating to your county level people would be the way to go. Don't aim for the state department of health. Um, you can reach out, I'm, I'm just saying as an example of state offices, you can reach out to us and we might be able to navigate you to your local level officials or partners. There's so many resources in the community that you can start conversations with. And together, there are always opportunities. A lot of this work needs funding, but when you partner with those organizations, you're able to easily access that funding. So that would be my suggestion, to start locally and then sign out as you go. Thank you. And as a millennial, I can just say that 
I encourage you to follow all the social media accounts that you can. I have a social media account strictly dedicated to all the transportation, local, state, municipal um, entities out there so that I can stay apprised of what's going on and I can respond to tweets, you know. Sometimes people aren't comfortable, you know, sending out a formal email and sometimes things get a little bit more traction on social media. So use your resources and definitely start local, but don't be afraid to follow everyone you can on social media. Yeah, I, I would I would say that the local um, your local jurisdictions um, they they have a whole network of of uh, people working in those communities um, who are advocating and and are very connected probably to the uh, policymakers and the uh, engineers that are involved in a lot of this and uh, and I do know like for instance um, speaking firsthand because I live in Montgomery County um, they are now redoing their uh, 10 year plan for vision zero for the county and they are going to be having a series of outreach events um, similarly i think uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, outreach that is being implemented in, in prince george's county with their vision zero planning efforts so it sort of depends on the local jurisdiction and i would say that if you if you send me an email um, i would be glad to connect you with some of the people in that jurisdiction your jurisdiction um, who are involved in, in implementing uh, pedestrian bicycle safety and people even that are activists and involved in uh, participating in trying to do that. It, it's really about creating a network of people interconnected and knowing what we're doing to try to make things safer across the state. And so whatever we can do to try to get people who want to be participants and actively engaged in this we want to network you with everybody. So, so yeah. So if you um, send send me a send me an email, and I'll I'll try to connect you. So, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and thanks to everybody who sent all the questions. Uh, you can see that their emails are up on the screen right now, and we'll share the questions, all of them, with the panelists as well. Um, so, in the interest of time, I guess we'll we'll kind of wrap here. But just wanted to give uh, each of you an opportunity to give us some closing thoughts. And uh, let's go in the order of the presenters. Uh, just the final message you want to leave us with, um, Dr. Olonge. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I'd like to really appreciate you. I appreciate everyone once again for the opportunity um, to participate on this webinar. And so my final word really would be about, we've talked about it a lot, um, the fact that you cannot do work in silos, right? We should all collaborate as much as possible, engage partners. Um, you're talking about equity, you're talking about health, you're talking about policy change, you're talking about environmental change, you're talking about the social determinants of health, which is a buzzword. Um, we need to collaborate and work with partners in the community. So like Jeff said, I would say network, 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 and network. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I just want to say that I was really pleased to be um, teamed with uh, Dr. Lange. You know, you know, Candice and I are working a lot on the safety side of things, you know, at the um, at MDOT. But the reality is, is that, you know, what underlies all this is health and um, and and thinking that how important it is to be walking and, and stay active. I know as I spend most of my day now sitting in a dining room in front of a computer, <laughs> you know, I, I need to be getting out and walking a lot more and, uh, and as do we all. And, um, and that is such an important, uh, you know, for the sense of well-being and, and, and staying healthy and, and, and preventing disease and all that, but that we need facilities in order to be able to do that. And I'm so excited right now to be, you know, working with MDOT and SHA and um, all the folks, you know, the MTA, all the folks at, at, at MDOT are really there's a new wind blowing about trying to create more pedestrian bicycle uh, friendly environments for people and for livable communities. And uh, and I think we are in a, in a crossroads now with some great promise to be able to really um, make things safer out there and drive these numbers down in terms of fatalities and serious injury collisions and, um, and get to zero. You know, that's the goal. That's what we're shooting for. And by shooting for that, you know, we're going to drive it down down close to that so that's that's it's very exciting and i really uh, appreciate being able to talk to you all about what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it 
So thank you again, Jeff and, and Dr. Longe for um, having me on this panel with you and, and listening to me and sharing your ideas and also with everyone else. Um, I would say one thing that I've really learned um, working through this context-driven implementation and working with all of our partners is that there really should be an emphasis on the four E's, so engineering, enforcement, education, and emergency medical services. Um, that is something that SHA takes seriously, and we really take advantage of our working relationship with all these other transportation business units to make sure that when we develop things like a pedestrian safety action plan, that it's comprehensive. It's not just focusing on how SHA used to do business, but looking at ways that we can collaborate to make our entire system better, um, and also just to consider the context around the roadway. So SHA really is changing the way that it does business, and I'm so happy to be a part of that as a um, newer employee, but um, really um, energized about this topic. So thank you all for attending. We had a pretty large crowd, and um, I'm so honored. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Great. Thank you all. And with that, we'll conclude our webinar today, Pedestrian Infrastructure Safety and Health. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to our speakers for a great presentation, to everyone who attended, and to Francine Waters and Brittany Brothers of MDOT who helped to pull all this together with us. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted online, and our participants today will be sent an email with the link. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And please join us for the next two programs in the Walktober Walk in Our series, New Trends and Technologies to Support Walkability and Walking, which will be next Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. And the following Thursday will be the final one, uh, which is Maryland Community Walk Initiatives, Walking the Walk of Maryland's Pedestrian Agenda. The uh, links are available where you uh, registered earlier on the web, and as well, we'll be providing the a blast out to all of the folks on our list. Have a great day.